It's hard not to empathise with historical Native Americans, particularly those such as Black Hawk, who would sacrifice everything to defend his home against invaders, only to lose all the same. Black Hawk was born in 1767 in the village of Sorkanuk on the Rock River, now modern day Illinois. Black Hawk's father was a well respected and honoured member of his community, being the tribe's medicine man, one who provides healing as the name implies. We don't know much about Black Hawk's youth, other than at the age of 15, he joined his father on a raid against the Osage, a notorious tribe who would dominate the area of Missouri and become both feared and revered by neighbouring tribes. The skirmish against the Osage would result in him killing and scalping his first enemy, scalping being the process of cutting off someone's scalp with their hair still attached and keeping it as a trophy. This would earn him much admiration in the eyes of his people, and would be the stepping stone for him to establish himself as a war captain, where he'd lead other raids. At the age of just 19, he led 200 men into battle against the Osage tribe once more, in which he personally killed 5 men and 1 woman. Black Hawk would attain an important role in his tribe, as he would be ushered into a prominent role upon the death of his father, who had sustained wounds in battle. The death of his father would hit him quite hard however, and it would take the young Black Hawk quite some time to mourn his loss. But in the next few years, Black Hawk would continue his raids on the Osage clan, at least up until 1812, when he was 45 years of age. He would serve as a war leader of a Sork band in the village of Sorkanuk, which boasted around 200 warriors. It wasn't until the war in 1812, between the forces of Great Britain and its occupancy in modern day Canada, and that of the United States, was Black Hawk notably mentioned in history. You see the British had a bit of a Napoleon issue going on in Europe, and dedicated many of their resources to dealing with him. However, this meant that they were ill-equipped to deal with the would-be Americans on the Great Lakes and the surrounding remote islands in the battle to secure territory. So the British began forming alliances with the native tribes, as well as with Black Hawk, who was commissioned as a brigadier general. This would earn him command over all native allies at Green Bay, and he was presented with a silk flag, a medal, and a written letter of recommendation from the British government. During this war, Black Hawk and the natives would fight in several engagements with Major General Henry Proctor on the borders of Lake Erie. Black Hawk would also engage in several skirmishes, though even with British backing, he was repelled by the United States forces, even when they were outnumbered, like in the case of Fort Stephenson, where the United States forces repelled the enemies using tactical marksmanship and a cannon known as Old Betsy. Black Hawk despaired over the many lives lost at the hands of the United States. In the end, he decided it was best to return home back to Sorkanuk. However, upon returning home, he would find his rival, Keokuk, had become the tribe's war chief and had taken his place. Outraged by this, and seemingly cast out, Black Hawk rejoined the British army in an effort to put an end to the bloodshed of his people. However, it was around this time in 1804 where the governor of Illinois, William Henry Harrison, drew up a treaty that legally allowed him to purchase the lands of the Sork tribe and the Fox tribe. The treaty would see the United States donate a thousand dollars a year to the Sork and Fox tribes, and would also guarantee the tribes the right to hunt and plant on their lands, despite no longer owning it. These terms would apply until the US decided that it was time for the natives to leave and relocate. The treaty was signed, but not necessarily by those who were authorised to do so. The tribe leaders deemed the treaty illegitimate, as it was not signed by anyone qualified or by anyone who spoke for the tribes as a whole. As history reports, the treaty was signed by a Sauk chief named Quashquami. Quashquami was described by Black Hawk as being an unintelligent man one who had low influence over the tribe, and one who lacked the noble ways of a warrior. In essence, he was said to be not the type of man that any would elect to sign such a treaty, nor was he by any means sanctioned to. In fact, if he did sign the treaty, then it's highly possible that he didn't even know what he was signing. Koshkwami later recalled that a man from his group had been captured by the United States for killing one of their own. Koshkwami and his men went to peacefully negotiate with the Americans to free their ally, to which the American chief declared that he would free him on the condition that they would trade for part of their land. 
Wishing to free his comrade, Kwashkwami was said to agree to this trade, but only agreed upon a small spot of land on the west side of the Mississippi. Supposedly, when this was all agreed upon and the prisoner was released, the United States forces shot him dead when he was running towards Kwashkwami. It was later understood by Black Hawk in his autobiography that Kwashkwami and his men were drunk and that this interpretation of the events by Kwashkwami was all Black Hawk had known about the Treaty of 1804 that would see him and his tribe booted out of their homes. Black Hawk states in his autobiography that Kwashkwami assured him that he never consented to the selling of their land and that the Americans had been disingenuous with their treaty. It wasn't until 1828 that the United States decided that it was time for the Sauk and Fox tribes to leave their land, as the treaty stated. Kyoku, who was Black Hawk's rival, had now taken his place and decided that resistance was futile and led the natives away from their home and towards the Iowa River. Black Hawk though condemned this act as cowardice and with his own band of warriors stood in defiance of the Americans. In April 1832, Black Hawk was motivated by the promises of an alliance, once more with the British, to repel the United States forces. He would obtain more than 1500 people in what would be called his British Band, though it would consist of both warriors and non-combatants, such as women and children. He would find no allies when venturing into Illinois, an act that made the new American settlers nervous to their presence. The American militia misconstrued Black Hawk's band as a threat, and upon their return to Iowa, the Americans would engage in what may have been an unprovoked attack in what would be known as the Battle of Stillman's Run. Many historians debate as to whether Black Hawk's entourage were engaged deliberately by the US, or whether this was an accident. Some sources even argue that Black Hawk and his British band attacked first, and that the American settlers were merely defending themselves. Accounts at the time of course vary, where the Americans state they were subduing other instances of Sauk assaults and so were justified in mistaking Black Hawk's men for attackers. Sauk accounts including those from Black Hawk himself indicate that they were unjustly pursued simply because they were natives. Either way, a number of violent engagements ensued and the war progressed where factions of other tribes soon joined Black Hawk in his quest to rebel against the American settlers. The war stretched on with battles and skirmishes on both sides, but one that sticks out is the Battle of Wisconsin Heights. Black Hawk and his entourage were still fleeing the militia, which was led by Colonel Henry Dodge of Illinois. The militia would march for 25 miles after Black Hawk, as well as sending the Ho Chunk tribe, a native tribe who had allied themselves with the United States forces to scout further ahead. Unable to find food and provide enough provisions for his band of warriors, as well as the elderly, the women and the children, Black Hawk soon found that many were in poor health, some even starving to death on the road. In his autobiography, Black Hawk stated that he had no intention in battling the Americans at this time, as his only concern was the well-being of his people. Instead, he sought to escape back across the Mississippi River, but upon the approaching of Colonel Henry Dodge's militia, he was left with no choice but to fight. On July 21st, 1832, the militia caught Black Hawk's band as they attempted to cross the Wisconsin River. Risking their own lives, Black Hawk and his warriors appeared on the surrounding hillsides in bids to distract the militia. It was Black Hawk's resolve this day that saw the bulk of Sauk and Fox civilians survive as they crossed the river and escaped via rafts. Black Hawk's warriors were not so lucky though, for their sacrifice would see many of them pay the ultimate price at the hands of Colonel Dodge's charge of bayonets. More US forces arrived to the battle and engaged with Black Hawk's men in a firefight for over 30 minutes. Furthermore, large groups of Sauk and Fox women and their children were gunned down by the US or their allied tribes once they reached further downstream. Black Hawk was able to escape however, where Colonel Dodge decided it was best to wait until morning to try and find him. By that point though, Black Hawk was gone. A Sauk chieftain named Nepope had remained behind and attempted to tell the militia officers that Black Hawk and his group had only wanted for the fighting to end and only sought refuge across the Mississippi River. However, the US troops did not understand him and it seems as if the Ho-Chunk tribe in which he had served with them were no longer in attendance. Therefore, Nepop's explanation of Black Hawk's true intentions went unheard. But Black Hawk's troubles were only just beginning. Most of his British band had been diminished 
as many had either left the cause, or in the case of the children, had simply died due to starvation. The militia who had been well fed and rested were able to pick up Black Hawk's trail again and close the gap on him relatively quickly. It would be on August 1st of the same year that about 500 men, women and children from the original 1500 would arrive at the eastern bank of the Mississippi, a few miles downstream from the mouth of Bad Axe River. Upon arrival, Black Hawk would hold a meeting to discuss their next move. Black Hawk was advised by fellow leader and prophet White Cloud that building rafts to sail across the Mississippi River was a waste of time because the US forces were closing in around them and would likely see them trying to escape. He urged Black Hawk to flee northward and to take refuge with another tribe, but most of the band decided that crossing the river was a far safer plan. While some of them managed to escape across the Mississippi River that same afternoon, a steamboat known as the Warrior emerged. Black Hawk and his followers raised white flags to surrender, but apparently, the emerging US soldiers failed to understand this message and proceeded to fire at them instead. The steamboat known as the Warrior let off several rounds of gunfire, but eventually withdrew from the battle because of a lack of fuel. 23 natives were killed, including a 19-year-old woman who used her own body to shield that of a child. Lieutenant Anderson witnessed this event as it happened and took the child to a surgical tent where the child's arm was amputated because a bullet had passed through his mother. It was then that White Cloud likely had his I told you so moment, where Black Hawk then agreed to move towards the north and not across the Mississippi. Black Hawk begged his followers to do the same, but many did not listen. Only three dozen of his men, including White Cloud, ended up following him north that same evening. The rest who were adamant on crossing the river proceeded to do exactly that, for they believed they would be delivered and free from pursuit after that. But to their disappointment, a large force of US troops had stumbled upon them in the early hours of the next morning. To make matters even worse, the steamboat the Warrior also made its grand return and saw to the slaughter of the remaining defenseless natives. Many women and children tried desperately to avoid the gunfire by entering the waters, but they were swept away by the current and likely drowned immediately. Pretty soon, the US forces would kill every native who tried to run for cover, or any who tried to step foot into the waters. More than 150 people were killed outright, even if they had laid down their arms. Those who did escape the gruesome scene only found a temporary relief, for they were captured and killed by another tribe who had joined the US Army. Only five soldiers of the United States Army were killed during the skirmish, whilst 19 were injured. You can see how this was a very much one-sided battle, with the US's superior weaponry easily overpowering the natives who were tired, hungry, and likely on the verge of death, having been pursued so relentlessly. Many historians refer to the event as a massacre, but the most compelling account comes from Major John Allen, who stated that killing the natives was a mistake. He said that had they come to meet and surrender, they would have been taken as prisoners of war and not simply decimated. He goes on to explain that it was a horrid sight to witness little children wounded and suffering, but that because they were an enemy of the US, it was justified. Black Hawk and the rest of his band would eventually make their way towards La Crosse River, where they camped for several days before encountering members of the Ho-Chunk tribe. The tribe counseled the band to surrender and despite initial refusal, both Black Hawk and White Cloud would eventually stop their struggle and submit. Black Hawk, White Cloud, Neopope, and several other leaders were imprisoned for eight months near St. Louis, Missouri, before they were taken east as ordered by US President Andrew Jackson and paraded about so as to impress on them the power of the United States. The leaders were met with crowds of people, many fascinated by them, and granting upon them an almost celebrity status. However, in areas like Detroit, the crowds were far less welcoming and chose to burn hanged effigies of the native leaders. Black Hawk was eventually freed and granted to live the rest of his life with the Sauk along the Iowa River. At the end of his life, he was said to reconcile with the American settlers and with his rival Keokuk, who was now the leader of the tribe. He would die on October 3rd, 1838, after a bout of illness. In some of his last words, 
Blackhawk stated, It has pleased the great spirit that I am here today. I have eaten with my white friends. The earth is our mother. We are now on it. With the great spirit above us, it is good. I hope we are all friends here. A few winters ago, I was fighting against you. I did wrong, perhaps. But that is past. It is buried. Let it be forgotten. Rock River was a beautiful country. I liked my towns, my cornfields, and the home of my people. I fought for it, but now it is yours. Keep it as we did, and it will produce you good crops. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about Blackhawk, and whether the man was a hero in his own right, or whether you saw him as more of a villain. Do you agree with the Treaty of 1804? and believe it was all done above board? Or do you think the Sulk chief Kwashkwami had no right signing that document, and therefore making the contract invalid? What about the massacre at the Mississippi River? Were the United States forces justified in killing off their enemy? Or was it perhaps a touch overkill? As always guys, if you've liked this video, then do give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Let me know if you've enjoyed this video of Native American history and whether you'd like me to cover more legends in this category. I'm looking for some suggestions, so feel free to fire away in the comments. Until the next time guys.